Well, this will be our third message on the second coming of Jesus Christ. Are you surprised that we're already in number three and we wasn't raptured out? Any of you surprised? Well, we still may not get through it. That's a good possibility. Keep in mind that the second coming of Jesus Christ will be in two stages. You first have the rapture of the saints. That's when He comes and takes all the saints out. And then you've got the revelation when He comes back with His saints at the end of the tribulation period that will begin the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. It's going to be an exciting time. Last Sunday, we looked at some of the things that will happen to the saints after the rapture. If you missed that message or even the first message, you can go watch them online at calvarysherman.com. Today, what we're going to do at we're going to look at what happens to those that are left behind. I hope you had a good breakfast. Uh, if you need to order something, go ahead and order it now. Because we're going to cover Revelation chapter 4 through Revelation chapter 19. So we may be here a while. Let me tell you something. This is one of the hardest messages I have worked on, and, and I don't know when. It's not difficult. This is my problem. It's not that I don't know what I want to say. It's what i fi- got to figure out what I can't say because I don't have enough time to say it all. So it's going to be difficult, but we're going to get there. But think with me for just a moment. Usually when we think about the rapture, it's exciting. It's comforting. And that's to the saints, amen? But I want you to pause for just a moment. And I want you to think about those that will not be raptured out. When I was a young boy, for some reason I thought one day the world would just come to an end. I remember I was living in Memphis, Tennessee, and, and I was out playing in the evening, and it was getting late, it was getting late, it was getting late. I didn't realize this daylight savings time thing, didn't know anything about that. It was getting late, and I thought, man, it's late, and the sun is still shining. I thought, maybe the world's fixing to come to an end. But as I began to grow older and begin to study the Word of God, I discovered that a lot of stuff has got to happen before this world comes to an end. A lot of stuff has to happen. We're going to be talking about that this morning and also next week as well. The rapture will not be the end. Instead, it will be the beginning of the worst time that this world has ever experienced. We'll talk about that in a scripture in just a moment. But one day, no doubt, the question will be asked, where has everybody gone? Husbands will wonder where wives are. Wives, husbands... Parents, children, children, parents. Men will be missing, women will be missing, boys will be missing, girls will be missing. Two shall be grinding together. The one shall be taken and the other will be left. There will be two working beside each other. And all of a sudden, one of them has gone. And then the next verse of Scripture, two shall be in the field. The one shall be taken and the other Left. Folks, that's what's going to happen. It's a real event. I know people have been talking about this for 2,000 years. The Apostle Paul expected the Lord to come back during his lifetime. And I'm expecting the Lord to come back during my lifetime. I've shared this with you more than once. I'm not, I'm not looking for a hole in the ground. I'm looking for a hole in the sky. I'm not looking for an undertaker. I'm looking for an overtaker. Amen? That's what I'm looking for. Notice this image that I have on the screen. I hope you can get a close-up of this of the camera so people online can see this. Folks, I don't even believe that this even depicts what's going to happen at the rapture. Notice this. Look at all the wrecks and the crashes. Look at the next image. The fires. Look at all this stuff going on. And then, then notice the next image. Christ returns. I doubt seriously if that will be in the newspaper, by the way. There will be some other excuse. 
fake news will come up with something, amen? But it won't be Christ's returns. One may pick up the newspaper or turn the TV channel on and, and you'll hear things like driverless car, bus, truck, and train wrecks. Airplane crashes due to missing crew members. Can you imagine being on an airplane, both the pilot and the co-pilot saved? And you're not. Mass confusion of radio and TV stations. Telephone circuits overloaded. Operators missing. Hospitals um, having missing patients. And listen to this. Not one single baby left in the world anywhere. Can you imagine tending the nursery at a hospital with a bunch of babies in there and all of a sudden they're all gone? They're all gone. Families will be terrified. They will be in shock over missing family members. But it will be too late for anyone left to do anything about it. Too late. This will be the beginning of the worst time that this world have ever experienced. So what's going to happen? <clears throat> some of this is speculation. Some of it, we're going to really look into the Word of God and you'll see some strong stuff in there. But according to the Bible, a world leader will rise up and he will appear to be the Savior of the remaining people. That will be the Antichrist. I think there's a strong possibility that he's living today. Don't know who it is. Don't know who this individual may be, but he will be accepted by the world. He will give some form of explanation for the missing multitudes. No mind, I don't know what he's going to say. Maybe some form of outer space came and took everybody away. Who knows? They'll come up with something. They'll probably bring China for doing it, most likely. Who knows? He'll bring in some degree of world peace, but it's only going to be temporary. And after all the mass confusion people will gladly accept Him as their God. And He will greatly deceive the world. Now, during the first three and a half years, it's going to be not too bad. I mean, other than all the confusion and everybody missing, and, and I mean, it's going to be bad. But it won't be as bad as the last three and a half years. The people that are left behind will be turning to anything or anyone for help. Look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, by our gathering together unto Him. Now, now this chapter 2 actually covers the rapture and the revelation. It covers a lot of things in between as well. And I'll try to show you what I think it's talking about. So go back to verse 1 one more time. It says, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto Him. Now we know what that's talking about, amen? That's talking about the rapture. Now notice verse 2. That ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us as that day of crime. That's talking about the Antichrist. What's holding him back? Who? who what? God? God's holding him back. Look at verse 8. Or verse 7. Where am I at? For the mystery of the iniquity doth already work, and only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. It's talking about the Holy Spirit. Verse 8. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. What is this talking about? It's not talking about the rapture. Don't get confused. It's talking about the revelation. Talking about when Jesus comes back to the earth. You know, Revelation chapter 1, verse 7, a lot of people get that verse uh, messed up. They think that's talking about the rapture. No, it's not. It says, every eye shall see him. That's the revelation. Every eye shall not see him when he comes back in the air. Amen? Only the saved will see him then. But when he comes back with his saints, then every eye shall see him. Look at uh, verse 8. And then shall they... Verse 9, <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Raymond's trying to keep me straight, and he can't do it. Don't worry, Linda can't either, so don't worry about it. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all powers and signs and lines and wonders, verse 10, 
and with all deceitfulness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. Verse 11. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. This is talking about the tribulation period. Verse 12 is interesting. That they all might be damned who believe not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. That they all may be damned. <clears throat> if this is talking about those that have been left behind, I want you to think with me for just a moment. They all will be damned because they did not believe and they did not trust Jesus as their Savior. Could it possibly mean that verse 12 tells us that if you have an opportunity to be saved during the church age and you reject and the rapture happens and you're left behind, could it be that this scripture says you are now damned because you did not believe? Now, there, I'll show you in a few minutes, there's going to be multitudes. That's going to be thousands and thousands and thousands of people that will be saved during the tribulation period. We're going to have 144,000 evangelists preaching the gospel. Amen? You're going to have the two witnesses. You're going to have angels going all over the world, all over the world preaching the gospel as well. Probably be more gospel preached then than they even are now. But it may very well be the only ones that will have an opportunity to be saved are those that did not have an opportunity to be saved because we, you and me, didn't help them to hear the gospel. Amen? Don't forget the purpose of these messages. It's not to get you excited about the rapture. It's to get you excited about telling others. That's the purpose of the messages. The temple in Israel, as I mentioned earlier, will be built if it hadn't already been built at the beginning of the tribulation period. The new world leader will eventually sit in the temple and claim to be God. And it will not be demonstrated until the middle of the seven years that he is the Antichrist. Look at Revelation 13. <clears throat> and they that worship the dragon which gave power unto the beast, and they that worship the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? Verse 5. And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given to him to continue for 42 months. This is talking about the last half of the tribulation period, three and a half years. Verse 6. And he opened his mouth to blaspheme against God, to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. Verse 7. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and the power was given unto him in all kindreds and tongues and nations. Verse 8. And all that dwell upon the earth, this is sad, shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. All that dwell upon the earth, whose names are not written in the Lamb's book of life, will worship him. And those that do not accept Christ will make a decision to receive the mark of the beast. And folks, it's, I think it's already right around the corner. The great tribulation will be horrible. Jesus himself warned that it would be the worst time that this world had ever experienced. Look at Matthew 24, 21. He says, For then shall be great tribulation such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time. No, not ever be. Think about this verse for just a moment. Folks, we have experienced some terrible times, even in our lifetime, have we not? I mean, some terrible, terrible times. But this verse, Jesus says, there is nothing that is bad as what this world will experience during the tribulation period. Nothing. Well, Revelation 4 through 19 primarily covers the tribulation period. It's also discussed in a numerous other passages, such as Daniel chapter 9, 
through chapter 12, Matthew 24, Zechariah chapter 12 through 14, many others. As I mentioned earlier, the tribulation period will be divided into two different periods, the first half and the second half, and the second half is the great tribulation. In the first three and a half years, the Antichrist will try to unite everyone in peace. Did you see what happened this, this past week? I don't know about you, but I rejoice about what happened this week for more than one reason. Notice the screen. Abraham Accords Peace Agreement. This happened this week, this last week. Amen? It says, Trinity, Treaty of Peace, Diplomatic Relationships, and Full Nominization between the United States, Abraham Immigrants, and the State of Israel. They, I don't mean what day it was now. They signed that treaty this week. Man, just making more preparations, amen? Folks, things are falling in line. I want to read some of this treaty. Listen to this. The government of the United Arab immigrants and the government of the state of Israel, hereafter the parties aspiring to realize the vision of the Middle East region that is stable, peaceful, and prosperous for the benefit of all states, peoples, and the region. Desiring to establish peace, diplomatic, and friendly relationships, cooperation and full normalization of ties between them and their people in accordance with this treaty and to chart together a new path to unlock the vast potential of their countries and of their region. Reaffirming the joint statement of the United States, the State of Israel, the United Arab, the Abraham Accords, dated August the 13th, 2020. Believing that the further development of friendly relationships meet the interests of the lasting peace in the Middle East. Did you hear what I said? Believing that the further development of friendly relations meet the interests of lasting peace in the Middle East. What we read earlier, there will be peace. False peace, fake peace, but it will be peace. It won't last. Effectively addressed by cooperation, not by conflict. Determined to ensure lasting peace, stability, security, and prosperity for both their states and to develop and enhance the dynamic and innovative economies. Hmm. Is that not interesting? I mean, this just happened. Just happened. You say, well, did this have to happen? No, it didn't have to happen. But I think dominoes are getting right in place. Right in place. The Antichrist will then offer the abomination of desolations. Look at Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease for the overshadowing of the abominations. He shall make it desolate even unto the consummation, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. That's what, that's what will happen in the midst of of the tribulation period. Look at chapter 12, verse 11. And from that time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away and the abomination that maketh desolation set up and there shall be 3,290 days. Calculate that out. That's three and a half years. And then notice what it says in Matthew 24, 15. When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet that we just read, standing in the holy place, who readeth, let him, let him understand. It will be a very terrible time. I hope you brought your Bibles today because we're going to look at a very, bunch of scriptures and some of them will be on the screen. In Revelation chapter 5, look with me there. Revelation chapter 5, in verse 1. And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside, sealed with seven seals. Now, please keep in mind the book of Revelation. I know y'all started studying it this morning in, in Sunday school. But chapter 1 is the introduction. Chapter 2 and 3 is the church age. Chapter 4 through chapter 19 is the tribulation period. Primarily covers that. 
And then um, 20 and 21 talks about the eternal age. But if you remember what we looked at last week in Revelation chapter 4 and verse 1, where it says, After this I looked, and behold, a door was open in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up here, and I will show the things which must be hereafter. This is after the church age. I think verse 1 references the rapture. And then we come to chapter 5. Now, in chapter 5, verse 1, we see a book. And this book is sealed with seven seals. Well, what is this book? What is this book that is sealed with seven seals? Did you know that Roman law required that a will be sealed with seven seals or seven times? So it could not be broken. In other words, they would take the wheel, and they would roll it up as far as they could, and then they would seal it. And then they'd roll it up a little bit more, and they would seal it the second time. Roll it up a little bit more and seal it the third time. They went all the way through that until they got to the the last seal. And once that is finally sealed on the seventh seal, it could not be broken without being discovered that somebody had looked into this wheel. So what is this book? I believe it's the title deed of the earth, the testament, the will and testament of the earth given back to Jesus Christ. Now look at verse 2, verse 2, and I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? Notice verse 3, this is what John is telling us, John saw this book, he saw it with seven seals on it. And nobody, nobody can open it. No man in heaven, nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And look, look, look what it did to John. John says in verse 4, And I wept much, because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. I think John possibly knew what the book was, but nobody could open it. No one could. And then one of the elders saith unto me, in verse 5, Weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. Now the rest, primarily the rest of the book of Revelation through about chapter 14, talks about the opening of these seven seals. He says in verse 6, And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne, and of the four beasts, in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb, as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, full of the evil spirits, seven spirits, I'm sorry, seven spirits of God, sent forth into the, all the earth. So when y'all get into Revelation, Steve and uh, Dave will tell you what all that means. But it has meaning. It has meaning. You say, why don't you tell me? I, might, I don't know what it means. What do you think? No, I do, but I want them to tell you. By the way, you can go to, the, um, go to our website, and on our website it's called a Revelation Series, and there is a verse-by-verse study of the book of Revelation that I did several years ago. Uh, I think I covered every verse in the entire book, but it's on the website. Verse 7, And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat on the throne, and when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them, harps and golden vows, full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain and have redeemed us to God by the blood out of every kindred, tongue, and people of all nations, and have made us into our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. And I beheld and heard the voice of many angels round about the throne, and the beasts and the elders, and the number of them were ten thousand times ten thousand and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice. Now let me tell you who's speaking in verse 12. Let me read it. Let me see if you can figure it out. So here's, here's all these people, many angels round about the throne and the beasts and the elders and the number of them, this is talking about the people here, ten thousand times ten thousand, thousands and thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and wisdom and and riches, and strength, and honor, and glory, and blessing. Folks, that's you and me. We're doing that singing. We're there. What John was able to see would happen in the future. 
and he saw this happen, and he saw how that Jesus came, and he will open the book, and will praise him, giving praise to Jesus Christ. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them, heard I say, and blessed and honor and glory and power be unto him that set up upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. And the four beasts said, Amen. And the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that liveth forever. Wow. Wow. What a day that will be. In Revelation uh, chapter 1 and verse 3, it says this. Blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein for the time is at hand. Both there's special blessings in reading the book of Revelation. And there are even extra special blessings in keeping what you read and obeying what you read in the book of Revelation. The Greek word for revelation, I'm sure you probably studied that this morning in your Sunday school, means to reveal. Some people think that the book of Revelation is a hidden book, that you can't understand it. Why in the world would God write a book that's hidden and can't be understood? That would make no sense whatsoever. The book of Revelation is the uncovering of the entire Word of God. It's the revealing of everything that you've already studied. The book of Revelation is the train depot of where all the train tracks come into the depot. This is, this is where everything begins to make sense in the book of of Revelation, this is where the entire Bible begins to fall in, in play. This is where it all comes together. In Genesis, Satan's doom is prophesied. In Revelation, it's realized. In Genesis, we see the creation of the heavens and the earth. In Revelation, we see the new heavens and the new earth. In Genesis, we see the first Adam reigning on the earth in the garden. In Revelation, we see the last Adam, who is Jesus Christ, reigning in glory. In Genesis, we see the earthly bride brought to the first man, Adam, there in the Garden of Eden. In Revelation, we see the heavenly bride brought to the last Adam, and that's Jesus Christ. In Genesis, we see the beginning of death and the curse in Revelation, Jesus puts an end to death, amen, and to the curse. In Genesis, Satan appears for the first time. In Revelation, he appears for the last time. Revelation, it all comes together. It all, and you, go, you will be blessed as you study Revelation. Ever how long it takes, it is probably going to take you three, six months, maybe longer. But it's a wonderful book to stretch. You're not going to understand every single verse of Revelation. I don't understand it all, but I understand the book, what it's talking about. That's very easy to understand. Very easy. And a lot of the stuff in the book of Revelation, you and I can understand it better today than they could 2,000 years ago. A whole lot better. So then we come to chapter 6. And we come to the opening of the seven seals. The first seal, we have the... the um, white horse rider. Um, there's two different opinions on who is on this right horse. Uh, what did the Sunday school book say? Did it say it was the Antichrist or Christ? Did it say? Well, y'all not there. Y'all not on chapter 6 yet. Okay, forget that. I'm sorry. You're on chapter 1. Sorry about that. Um, I remember um, when I was going to the seminary, Conrad Glover, who was one of the founders of the Missionary Baptist Seminary, he wrote a book. It's called the... Um, the Great White Horse Rider, I believe was the name of it. And he was the first one that I've ever heard that said that the White Horse Rider is Jesus Christ. I personally believe it's the Antichrist. That's just my opinion. But you got the first seal is the Great White Horse Rider where it says this, and I saw 
when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard as it were the noise of the thunder, and one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. And when he opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, Come and see. And there went out a horse that was red, and power was given unto him that they're, that they're on to take peace from the earth. See, this is beginning the great, uh, the great tribulation. Take peace from the earth, and they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. And when he opened the third seal, I heard, see, these, this seal one, two, three, four, five, six opens very fast. Very fast. Actually, in my opinion, chapter 6 is just simply a summary of the entire book of what's going to happen during the tribulation period. But everybody don't hold to that, but that's what I believe. In verse 5, And when he had opened this third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see, and I behold, lo, a black horse, and he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny. And said, Thou hurt not the oil and the wine. So everything's going to be rationed. It's going to be very hard, very difficult to get food. And when he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse. And his name that sat on him was Death and Hell followed with him. And power was given unto him over the fourth part of the earth to kill with the sword and with hunger and with death and with the beast of the earth. Let's stop here for just a minute. Power was given unto him over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword and with hunger and with death and with the beast of the earth. The world population is close to 8 billion, 7.6 or something like that. When the rapture occurs, I don't know how many will be raptured out. Well, let's just say 2 billion. I think I'm really making it high. But let's just say that, and then you've got 6 billion left. If a fourth of the world is killed, that's 2 billion people killed. I wonder how the news is going to broadcast that. That's a whole lot more than what the coronavirus has took, Amen. That's a lot of people. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God. This is exciting. And for the testimony which they held, and they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes was given in every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season, while their fellow servants, also their brethren, that should be killed as they were, should be fulfilled. So, during the, during the tribulation period, based on what I'm just reading right here, you'll be raptured out instantly. Well, we, we're not raptured out instantly, are we now? But during the tribulation period, when you're killed, you'll be just kind of raptured out instantly. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, lo, and there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became his blood, and the stars of the heaven fell upon the earth, that even as a fig tree cometh for figly, untimely figs, when she is shaken of a mighty wind, and the heavens departed as a scroll when it rolled together, and every mountain and every island was moved out of their places. Can you imagine the devastation that this is going to create? And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man, hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the rocks, listen to this, they wanted to die. They began to hide themselves. They were scared. Verse 16, and said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sat upon the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come. And who shall be able to stand? And then we come to chapter 7. Between the sixth seal and the seventh seal, there is going to be a pause of the judgment. Look at verse 1. And after these things I saw four angels standing in the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, 
having the seal of the living God, and he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and to see, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of God in their foreheads. Now, who are these servants? Look at verse 5, 4. And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and there were sealed 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel. I read commentaries on this, and I, I do not understand some of these commentaries, how they can get this so mixed up. I've heard people say, oh, this is not talking about Jews. This is not talking about this. It's not talking about that. What is the, I believe the Bible. <laughs> It's 144,000 Jews, and it's actually 12,000 from each tribe. It tells you exactly who these Jews are, and what are they going to do? If you look here and look over in, in uh, chapter 14, I think it is, they will be 144,000 evangelists that will be going throughout the world. See, my friend, God is a God of mercy. He still wants to see people saved, amen? And they'll be going throughout the world proclaiming the message of God. Look, look down to verse 9 of this same chapter, Revelation 7. Look at all the people that's going to be saved. After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and peoples and tongues, stood before the throne, and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands, and crowd with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sit upon the throne, and unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne, and about the elders and the four beasts, and fell before the throne, their faces, and worshipped God, saying, Amen, blessed glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto God forever and ever. Boy, they're excited. And one of the elders said unto, answered, said unto me, Who are these folks? Who are these people? Again, I've heard commentaries say, Well, this is all the people that's all been saved. No, it's not. This is the folks that are saved during the tribulation period, I believe, under the ministry of the 144,000 evangelists. One of the elders, verse 13, answered and said unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes, and whence cometh they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, They are they which come out of the great tribulation. And they've washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore are they before the throne of God and serve him day and night in the temple. Now they're in serving God. And in the set upon the throne shall dwell among them. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. See, they didn't receive the mark of the beast, folks, and they couldn't eat. Shall, and neither shall the sun light on them nor any heat. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them and shall lead them into the living water, fountains of water. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. They get their tears wiped out before we do. Isn't that pretty cool? Ours don't happen until Revelation 21. We're going to talk about that next week. And then we come to chapter 8. And then we see the um, opening of the seventh seal in verse 1. It said, when the, and when he had opened the seventh seal, this will begin the seven trumpets, by the way, there were silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. And you know I'm going to be humorous here, but I'm told not to do it. So y'all figure out, is there some people that might not be in heaven since there's going to be silence for 30 minutes? Hmm. And another angel came and stood at the altar having a golden censer, and there was given unto him much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne, and the smoke of their incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's heaven. And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar and cast it into the earth. And there were voices and thunders and lightnings and earthquake. And then the seven angels which had the seven trumpets prepared to be sound. Now we're going to have the blowing of the uh, seven trumpets. So let's look at them real quickly. 
And the first angel sounded, and there was followed hail and fire mingled with blood, and they were cast upon the earth, and the third part of the trees was burnt up, and all the green grass was burnt up. So now all the vegetation is gone. Where, where are they going to get the food? It's gone. And the second angel sounded, and it were the great mountain burned with fire and was cast to the sea, and the third part of the sea became blood. Now everything that's in the sea is beginning to die. And the third part of the creatures were in the sea and had life died, and the third part of the ships were destroyed. And the third angel sounded, verse 10, and there fell a great star from heaven, burdened as it were a lamp, and fell upon the third part of the rivers and the, upon the fountains of the water. And the name of the star is called Wormwood. And the third part of the waters became wormwood, and many died of the waters because they were made bitter. It means it was poison. It was poisonous. Verse 12. And the fourth angel sounded, and the third part of the sun was smiting, and the third part of the moon, and the third part of the stars. So as to the third part of them were darkened, and the day shone not for a third part of it, and the night likewise. And behold, I heard, listen to this, listen to this. And I heard and beheld an angel flying through the midst of the heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth, by reason of the other voices of the trumpet of the three angels which are yet to be sound. So now we're fixing to come across the three woes, which is going to be pretty bad, very, very bad. <clears throat> and then we come to chapter 9, and we have the fifth trumpet, which is the first row. And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven upon the earth, and him was given the key of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottom of his pit, and there arose the smoke out of the pit as the smoke of a great furnace in the sun, and the air was darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and upon them was given power, and the scorpions of the earth have power, and it commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have, the, which have not the seal of God in their forehead. Now let me just stop here for just a second. It, it talks about locusts and it talks about what their heads look like and they had stingers in their tails and their heads look like, uh, I can't even remember now, but it talks about all this stuff. Please keep in mind that John is writing this and he's writing what he sees and to him they look like big locusts. Could it possibly be that what he is actually seeing is something that you and I know exactly what it is. Big fighting helicopters. They have machine guns in their tails, and, and they, got, they look kind of crazy looking. So keep that in mind. John is writing what he sees, but he's never seen some of the stuff that you and I have already seen. Verse 5, And to them was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tor tormented five months, and the tor tor torment was as the torment of a scorpion, and he striketh like a man. And in those days shall men seek death. Notice verse 6. And shall not find it. And shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. They will want to die. But the scripture says they will not find it. Can you imagine the torment of wanting to die? These are Christ rejectors, do they not understand the very moment that they die, it gets worse? No, they don't understand that because they have been betrayed and bewitched by Satan himself. And then we have uh, the second row. Let's jump all the way down to verse 13. One row is passed. Behold, there cometh two rose more hereafter. <clears throat> and the six angels sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the six angel, which had the trumpet, Loose the four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates. Now listen to this. And the four angels was loose, which prepared one hour and a day and a month and a year to slay the third part of men. And the number of the army, listen to this, and the number of the army of the horsemen were 200,000 thousand, and I heard the number of them. I think that's 2 million. Somebody can calculate that out a little bit later. And thus I saw the horses in the vision, and them that settled on them, having blessed praise of fire. And Jeneth, see, again, John is writing what he sees and trying to describe it the best way that he understands 
and brimstone, and the heads of the horses were as the head of lions, and out of their mouths issued fire and smoke and brimstone. This was before there was any automobiles or any airplanes or anything what John is looking at. For these three were the third part of men killed by the fire and the smoke and by the brimstone which issued out of their mouths. Verse 19, the fire is in their mouths and in their tails, and for their tails were likened to the serpents and had heads with them that do hurt. And the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues, listen to this, you'd think they would repent, don't you? But the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues yet repented not of the works of their hands that they should not worship devils, idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and of wood, which neither can see nor hear nor walk. Neither repented they of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their fornication, nor of their thefts. Folks, you think it's bad now? Nothing is compared to the evilness of mankind after all of the saints are gone. Whew, they're pretty bad. And then we come to the, um, the two witnesses. Um, let's jump over to chapter 11, verse 3. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred threescore days clothed in sackcloth. Calculate that up. That's three and a half years. And these are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before God of the earth. I've heard commentaries again talk about, well, let me tell you who these two witnesses are. One of them is, is Elijah, and one of them is this, and one of them is Moses. And one of them. We don't know who they are. If God wanted us to know who they were, he would have told us. Why do we spend all this time trying to figure something out and God hasn't told us? Anyway, we've got two witnesses. What do they do? They witness. They share the message of God. And if any man were hurt them, verse 5, Fire will proceed out of their mouth and devour their enemies, and if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. That's pretty tough. These have power to shut up heaven that it rain not in the days of their prophecy, and have power over waters to turn them to blood, and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that sinneth, sinneth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them, and shall overcome them and kill them. Uh-oh. They're going to be killed. And then look at verse 8. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. And they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half, and shall not suffer their bodies to be put in graves. Can you imagine the hallelujahs that's going on now? I'm talking about ungodly hallelujahs. The shouting. Everybody's, oh, we killed them. We killed them. And they just left them in the streets. Let the bodies rot. Verse 10, and they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall send gifts to one another. It's Christmas time because they killed the two witnesses. Because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth. They didn't torment them. They tried to get them to Christ. But notice what happened in verse 11. And after three days and a half, hmm, the spirit of life from God entered into them. And they stood upon their feet. And great fear fell upon them which saw them. I can just imagine all the cameras of all the world. You see, back then... Before TV, you, you wouldn't know how, how, would, how would all the world see this. But now we know how the world, all the world can see what's going on. I can just see the cameras focusing on that, and all of a sudden, is that hand moving? What's going on here? And they begin to see what's happening. And then it says in verse 12, And they heard a great voice from heaven and said unto them, Come up here to and they ascended up to heaven in a crowd, and their enemies beheld them. Wow. Pretty amazing, amen? And then we come to the seventh trumpet, sounded in chapter 11, verse 15. 
And then in chapter 12, it talks about Christ and Israel and how Satan has tried to stop Christ from coming. Go and, go and read that uh, later because it's pretty interesting. And then we come to chapter 13, and we see the power of the Antichrist. Look at verse 5 of chapter 13. And there was given unto him a mouth speaking with great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. That's three and a half years. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. It's talking about the Antichrist. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Wow. Wow. And then if you jump down to verse 16, we see the mark of the beast. He causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the name, number of the name. And here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six. I remember, I forget where we was now, but I got a telephone. I think it was in Tennessee. And the telephone number had 666 in it, and I told the lady, I don't want that number. <laughs> you say, are you crazy, Pastor? I didn't want it. I didn't want people calling 666 when they called me. I've been accused of a bunch of other things. I didn't want to be accused of being the Antichrist. <clears throat> Not at all. And then we come to chapter 16. And we come to the vials that will be poured out upon the earth. Let's scan through this real quickly. And I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, Go your ways and pour out the vials on the wrath of God upon the earth. Verse 2. And the first went and poured out his vial upon the earth, and there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast, and upon them which worshipped his image. And the second angel poured out his vial upon the sea, and it became the blood of a dead man, and every living soul died in the sea. Now everything is gone in the sea. The third angel poured out his vial upon the rivers and fountains of water, and they became blood. Verse 5, And I heard the angel of the waters say, Thou art righteous, O Lord, which art and was and, was, and shall be, because thou hast judged thus. For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets. And thou hast given them the blood to drink, for they are worthy. Verse 7, And I heard another out of the altar saying, Even so, Lord God, almighty, true and righteous are thy judgments. Verse 8, The fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun, and power was given unto him to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with great heat and blasphemed the name of God, which hath power over these plagues, and they repented not to give him glory. These people are evil. And the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seed of the beast, and his kingdom was full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues for pain. Notice that. They gnawed their tongues for pain and blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their souls and repented not of their deeds. And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. Then look all the way, that, this is a preparation of the battle of um, Armageddon, by the way. And then look all the way down to verse 17. And the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air, and there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne, saying, It is done. And their voices and thunders and lightnings, there was a great earthquake, such as was not since men were upon the earth. So mighty an earthquake and so great. And the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell, and the great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine and the fierceness of his wrath. And every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. Verse 21, 
and there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent. That's heavy. And then, but notice, and men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, for the plague thereof was exceedingly great. There you have it. That's the short version of the tribulation period. It's going to be pretty bad, isn't it? So last week we saw what happens to the saints after the rapture. That's where I want to be, amen? Today we've seen what happens to those that are left behind. And that is not where I want to be. Next Sunday, if we're still here, We will look at Revelation, some of Revelation 19, uh, then in 20 and 21. We're going to talk about the millennial reign. We're going to talk about the eternal age. And that's going to be the best part of this whole series. That's what I'm looking forward to. But let me remind you again, the purpose. By the way, we'll discuss this tonight. I'm a little bit scared to do that, but maybe I'll get David. I'll stay home and let Dave discuss this. That might be cool. No, I wouldn't do that to my fine associate pastor. Don't forget the purpose of the message, the series. It's not just to get you excited about the rapture. We already are, amen? Y'all may not get to go on your trip. Does that be okay? Do I? Moses and Noah and all that? Yeah. But the purpose of the message is this. Folks, there's people that are not ready. Do you truly understand that? We just looked very quickly what's going to happen to those that are left behind. I, I wouldn't want my worst enemy to go through that mess. We have got to do what we can to share the message with others. Share people the messages off our website. Send them the link. Share the Facebook post. Share whatever you can. Talk to them personally. But folks, this is going to happen. And I just showed you what happened last week with the with the signing of the peace treaty. It's getting close. People need the Lord. Not just to get them through the coronavirus. Not just to get them through this crazy political world that we're engaged in. It's going to get worse. But people need the Lord because without Him, when the rapture occurs, look what they're going to face. I've got a video that I want you to watch, and this is going to be an invitation. I believe God can talk to you through this message, and I believe God can talk to you through this video. And if God speaks to you this morning about something that you need to do, you need to do that today. So during the invitation, we'll, the invitation will be the video. I invite you to come. If you need prayer, I want to pray with you. If you're watching online, I want to pray with you. But your greatest need, if you've never trusted Jesus as your Savior, my friend, that's what you need to do today. Don't wait till tomorrow. You don't have the promise of tomorrow. This could be the very last service that you will ever be in. You need to accept Christ today, and you do that by simply understanding that you're a sinner separated from God. And you believe that Jesus Christ came and died and was buried and resurrected from the grave. If you put your trust in him and ask him to save you, he will save you now. Don't worry about any of the other details. Just accept him as Christ and repent of your sins, and he will save you. But people do need the Lord. So I want you to stand as we watch this brief video. Or you can stay seated, whichever you prefer to do. It's entirely up to you. Let's watch the video. <clears throat> 